It's my observation that fascism takes advantage of highly monopolized and socially isolated societies to more easily spread the hate that furthers fascistic goals. I'd consider myself part of the admittedly cliché hate is learned camp of thinking, but this core idea seems to ring true when we understand how fascism preys upon people to force an ideology one would not naturally come to the conclusion of. While I'm sure you're itching to have me explain how social isolation greatly contributes to the spread of fascism, there are a few other things I need to explain first, such as their affinity for the monopolization of power and the hate override effect. Fascists believe some very absurd things. Some academics call this the big lie when referring to historic examples of fascism. However, it's important to note that this doesn't hurt their movement. They're not democratically minded individuals, so they don't care to reconsider their ideas if they aren't popular. If anything, they rather favor monopolizing power in the hands of people who already agree with them to fix this issue. Nick Fuentes has said on occasion that he's fully aware that his platform is unpopular, and comes to the conclusion that they need a dictatorship to force his brand of morals on people. On the slightly less extreme side, there are conservative figureheads who call for raising the voting age and closing polling stations at colleges because it's usually young people who disagree with the conservatives' further and further right platform. Notice, though, that both of these people aren't concerned with democracy. They rather prefer to give more power to the small groups of people who do agree with them instead of trying to win over more people by changing their platform. Fascists are aware that empathy is a core function of how people work. It's an aspect of evolutionary psychology to have empathy on some kind of tribal level because we were more likely to survive through cooperation than strict every-man-for-himself ways of thinking. In the modern world, this usually means that most people don't really have a problem with different groups such as the disabled, people of color, or the LGBTQ community, especially since their existence doesn't personally harm individuals who are not part of those identities. As such, it's hard for a fascist to be able to express their violent beliefs towards these groups to the average person since it makes them sound barbaric and violent. It's this next step that makes fascists so effective in getting that hate to stick with everyday people. See, fascists understand that every society has groups of people they would uncritically kill or hate. Violent criminals, communists, groomers, and Nazis, to name a few. So, instead of explicitly saying they want to commit violence against a marginalized group or enemy, they attempt to associate such groups with vastly unfavorable ones. This is how fascists get many people to override their ability to think critically by building up one's emotions of hate. Fascists aren't empirically minded, and their way of indoctrinating individuals follows suit. Putin has convinced his soldiers that the Ukrainians they're fighting are not actually their brothers from a different land, but instead Nazis because he knows that's a group of people Russians would be willing to uncritically murder. Some parts of the American conservative movement have been painting Democrats as communists and LGBTQ people as groomers because they, like Putin, are also aware that these are groups that people are willing to kill. If you've seen my video on proxy politics, this song and dance isn't new. A tyrant will not openly demand that they want to arrest their political enemies, but instead say that they're cracking down on drug use. One who commits a genocide doesn't say they want to eradicate trans people, but instead says they want to eradicate groomers. Point being, a fascist needs some way of convincing the people to commit the genocide their politics require, and this is their unfortunately effective way of doing it. I'll admit, I make that sound incredibly straightforward, but what needs to be understood about this specific fascist tactic is that it works best within the right conditions. Building these conditions requires power, and is the setup for making this strategy successful. When asking someone about fascism, most people will talk about authoritarianism or weaponized bigotry. However, many fail to also note that fascists have an affinity for capitalism. This is certainly true, especially in regards to the various companies such as Coca-Cola and IBM who profited off of business operations in Nazi Germany. But it's important to explain why fascists seem so willing to play along with capitalists. Capitalism, like fascism, prefers that populations are kept separated and isolated. This works within a capitalist's favor because it means that workers are less likely to question their conditions or form unions, and in the case of fascists, it means it's easier to lie to individuals about types of people that they've never met. You're inoculated against racist and anti-LGBTQ propaganda if you have friends that are gay or black, and fascists know this. So, they tend to favor capitalists and the societies they build because it means less social spaces, less leisure time, and more entertainment gained from cheap means such as television. This all adds up to you having less friends and spending more time listening to people who come to conclusions for you. In such an environment, it is inconvenient to ask a gay person what their opinions are, so let's just listen to this straight news anchor on television sum it up for us. Really, this is just the whole, what do women want? We ask a panel of men joke, but in real life. Fascists want to control the conversation, and to do this they need to make sure that diverse people are kept only in their isolated bubbles so that way they don't interact with all the straight white people they're trying to convince of fascism. Capitalism makes this incredibly easy to do through its tendency for monopolization. Instead of trying to gain control of multiple political parties or news stations, a fascist only needs to control perhaps one or two, since any of the ones they pick will have a large sphere of influence due to lack of competition. Whether capitalists like it or not, aspects inherent to their economic system work in favor of fascism. Capitalists pander to the most profitable, and fascists pander to the most vulnerable. 
They're both predatory ideologies that are opposed to utilitarianism and empiricism, so it's no wonder that they have their affinities for each other. These similarities get to the point where defenders of both ideologies sound similar to each other. Capitalists decry against the lazy and unproductive poor, while fascists decry against the degenerate and destructive non-whites. Capitalists favor an upper class of mostly rich people. Meanwhile, fascists favor an upper class of mostly white people. This does not mean that rich or white, or for that matter rich and white people are evil, but that by telling them that they are somehow magically superior due to attributes unrelated to any actual unique or useful skills they possess, it makes it easier to convince them to be uncharitable of the groups of people they think they're superior to, economically or ethnically. It begins to paint such other groups as the enemy, especially since they have very little interaction with them. This is why capitalists and fascists decry public spaces, public transportation, public housing, and other socially beneficial projects. It's not just because it eats into the profits of landlords and car dealers or because it begins to mix poor people of color with rich whites, but because it makes it harder to enforce fascistic and capitalistic ideas on a given population. Whites and people of color being in the same community makes it harder for fascists to fearmonger whites about people of color. The poor and rich living in similar communities makes the rich realize that their wealth might not have always been gained from hard work since these poor people they mingle with work hard too, yet still don't reap the same rewards they have. This very way of getting people to socialize more is a very strong tactic that can de-radicalize people away from oppressive ideologies. One ex-Nazi TED Talk presenter had mentioned that getting his Nazi friend to visit Muslims in person helped de-radicalize them from the neo-Nazi movement. Muslims become much less scary when you meet them in person and realize that you've been lied to by people who wish to take advantage of you. The same goes for other groups of people that fascists love to fearmonger about. Obviously, this isn't a foolproof way of getting people to change their minds. Fascists tend to take advantage of those who are vulnerable such as lonely men, the poor, and the youth, and these people might very well be sold on fascist ideas for more than just reasons of fear. Regardless, I think it's important to remind leftists that we should not give up on these vulnerable groups of people, especially since they need our help the most to keep them safe from an opportunistic fascist. I say leftists and not liberals because it's my opinion that it requires a person who critiques the system fascists benefit from instead of trusting that such systems will always stay uncorrupt enough to utilize against fascists. Just as fascists take advantage of repressive systems to further their agenda, they also take advantage of how spineless their most powerful political opponents are, and historically, that's liberals. Liberals lack an ability to decry authoritarian systems, because let's face it, their job is to uphold them, which means they don't entertain the idea of dismantling them. Liberals are too caught up in trusting the systems of electoralism, law, and capitalism to sort out the problems they seek to fix instead of questioning whether or not these systems are actually fair or effective. They trust the system more than they value achieving the best outcomes. In closing, fascists are not empirical or utilitarian, they're opportunistic, and it takes a person who is both opposed to facts and utility, the attribute of opportunity, to get anything done. It is only when we recognize this that fascism can be deconstructed not just by directly opposing them, but by building social environments that make their ideas less appealing.